I see by the broken clock on the wall it's time to do another video. This is going to be a review of the uh, book that I read for People in April, which is the tag, uh, the April booktube tag from Ross at Scally Danling about the book, um, and Elizabeth at, oh, I can't pronounce her channel, I'll put the links in there, Bach Queen's books, anyway, uh, Ross and, and Elizabeth started this great uh, April event that's going around to read a book about uh, related somehow to people, like a memoir or a biography or uh, something like that, or a collection of letters. Not the kind of genre I read that much of, uh, but one that I want, want to read more of, and one that with, over the years, with many good intentions, I've downloaded many books in the public domain, different diaries, different letter collections and things. And one of the books that I had downloaded for free is called, let me get back to the page here, oh, maybe I can't, oh my goodness, okay, it is called The Adventures of an American Girl in London, Adventures of an American Girl in Victorian London, by Elizabeth L. Banks, it's got a subtitle here, Adventures of an American Girl in London, Campaigns of Curiosity. So what this is, is a, it's a, a young woman. It was published in 1894. It's a young woman who's from America, living in London, who's trying to get started as a writer. She gives a, a two different... Here we go with my feelings about memoirs again and uh, f feelings about nonfiction, personal nonfiction. Gives two different stories about how this book came to be written. There's the prologue of the edition itself, which I think is probably the more accurate one. And then what it is, it's it's the book is a collection of of essays of newspaper columns that she wrote, and she gives a different. And in the first of those, she gives a different account of how she started on this path. What she's basically doing is working as an undercover journalist. or working undercover as a journalist, if you want to put it that way, in the sphere of uh, domestic worker, uh, manual laborer, that kind of thing, in London, England, in the Victorian age. She's clearly from upper classes. Well, she's at least middle class or above from the United States. You can tell because of uh, her references and things. And she's, worked, she's lived in homes where she's had servants herself. Uh, so she decides. Um, so she's visiting London. She decides after after college, or after her educational career, and she decides she really likes it there and she wants to stay. So she starts looking uh, for some kind of work that can keep her in London longer. This is her explaining in the prologue, and she ends up getting. Uh, she ends up writing a. She writes an essay that's a response. There, apparently there's a, a notable essay written at this time by Rudyard Kipling, which is kind of uh, disparaging to Americans, um, or she feels it is, and she writes an essay of her own called An American Girl Responds to Mr. Kipling, or something like that. And she didn't really go into the details much of that, so it was probably something that was pretty well known at the time, but she didn't feel like she had to recap in the prologue of, of her book. Anyway, based on that, which is published in an American magazine, it's very successful for her. So from that, she's able to start getting work as a journalist. And she proposes this column, which runs in a British paper. Um, probably don't care about the details that I have to look them all up or anything, but where she'll go out, she'll try and get a job as a domestic, and then report back on what it's like to be a domestic servant in uh, Victorian England at that time, and she has no. And she's uh, she's a very good writer. She makes no bones about the fact that she's really not qualified for this kind of work, and she hasn't done much housework or anything, and she doesn't know how to do it. She mentions trying to sweep once, you know, and blistering her hands, and not even knowing the proper uh, uh, way to sweep a floor. She starts. Uh, um, 
and then you know that's the prologue and, and she, she sort of breaks down what she does she does different uh, she investigates different kinds of work it's not a very long book she mentions some of the the in the prologue she mentions some of the um, feedback she got from it later and then we go into the first of the essays which is uh, which tells a completely different story about how, how and why she started doing this she because it's interesting since the book is called an American girl and when she writes the column she tries to hide the fact that she's American so she sets up sort of a so not only is she in in one sense she's setting up a persona to to go undercover as it were to get a job as a domestic a quote unquote lower class type job that she's overqualified for you know in terms of education and, and background and stuff and on the other hand she's uh, disguising her actual identity and that in her columns by saying that she's by pretending to be uh, representing herself in in the early columns at least as as an English girl is a young English woman um, and it's very funny she she acknowledges in the prologue that she immediately gets called out on this by using words like like sink instead of basin and there's a couple other things like that which made it very obvious right away to anybody reading the article that she was that she had an American background not a British background which I just have to blame on them on the newspaper editors if they didn't catch that if they see if she's writing kitchen sink in her article and they don't and then the editor since it was a British paper doesn't immediately see that it's a that she means a kitchen basin which is how they would refer to it then I, I, I don't know whether the editors were lazy or, or just uh, didn't care if it was noticed or anything so she gets called out on that kind of stuff so she she ruffles some feathers she ruffles some feathers in Uh, among working class people that, that in a bit they feel like she she's being kind of exploitive to uh, to try and tell their story and some of the and she had expected you know some of the wealthy people that she worked for would be maybe upset if they found out that she was undercover and, and but but they weren't actually they're kind of flattered it seems uh, she gets a couple first she has a difficult time there's just what i liked about this book the reason i wanted to read it is i read a lot of uh, books from this era as i mentioned in other videos although i haven't done any specific reviews of these novels like by henry james or edith edith wharton both writers i admire very much um because i haven't read any since i started the channel but it's an era that i'm interested in i like it I thought it would be interesting to read about the background of what people's lives are really like, especially the, the people who were not as often or very often at all the subjects of books, you know, because subjects of Victorian novels are rarely uh, people of the working class. I mean, Dickens is, a, is an exception, of course, uh, but most most people who had the leisure and and uh, education to write would have been upper middle class, like uh, Henry James or Wharton themselves, and had that more of that point of view. So I wondered what, what it was like for the domestic servants and stuff. And I guess you know, from Downton, Downton Abbey and all those different kind of things, we we kind of know now and from later books but so she goes uh she she starts out she gets hired by this newspaper to to do these columns and she starts out the way she represents how she gets the idea in the actual first column i think is is got to be complete fiction maybe not but because she doesn't mention any of this in the prologue but in in the pretense of the first column she writes she's talking to a seamstress one day or watching the seamstress work uh, in a like a public sweatshop kind of place watching all these women work and sort of takes uh, 
you know, interested in one her own own age and interested in her story and listening to her, you know, the the you know, talking a little bit about the backbreaking nature of this work, and then she, the author Elizabeth Banks, decides she goes, "I have a great idea. Why don't um, I hire you to be my domestic servant?" And then you don't have to work in this crappy uh, seamstress shop anymore. And and this this falls at the end of a long conversation about how difficult it is to be a, a seamstress working on a sewing machine, and you know for hours and hours on end for very little wages. <clears throat> and the and the girl, the young woman who Elizabeth Banks offers this job to, gets very upset, gets very offended. She's like, I will never go. I will never be a maid again. I will never go back into domestic service. I'm not going to wear. A cap and apron, they, that term comes up a lot. And then she feels insulted. So Elizabeth Banks uh, is kind of taken aback by this, doesn't understand why. And so she decides to investigate the, the service industry herself by get, getting a job going undercover. Now, you see already the issue, right? This is a completely different story, origin story of how she became an undercover journalist. Then she tells in the prologue. So I have, I doubt this, the second version. I have more doubts about the second version because um, it seems a little too dramatic and a little too contrived compared to the, the one in the prologue, which seems more, uh, more likely and uh, um, honest where she's just, she wants to be a writer, she's just looking for things to write about, and she gets a job writing, and she goes undercover. Be that as a maid, she, she has very interesting um, experiences, which I think are mostly accurate. Um, she, she, first of all, she sets out, you know, not really knowing how to get a, a service job. She starts looking at the help wanted, and she sees that she's not really she doesn't really have the kind of qualifications that people are looking for, and there's very there are odd qualifications for. Her. Apparently, she Elizabeth Banks is not very tall, and apparently, being tall is a very important qualification. And all these ads she's seeing must be tall, must be, must have twelve years reference, you know, twelve months reference. It's, it's it's all it's all the same thing that people put in one ad say you must you must have. Uh, you must be young and eager and willing to learn and you must have a thousand years of, of experience and everything and you must be wild, wildly competent and, and, and experienced and be able to work for no wages because we don't want people here who just want a job to have a job to make money. We want people who are just want to grow with the company. You know, it's all the same crap that people want in an ad. And she apparently doesn't have enough um, experience of looking for work to realize, and it doesn't say in this thing, I guess maybe I can find out on Wikipedia or something, how young she is, but I, I think she's around 22, 23 or something like that, I would guess. It never occurs to her to just go ahead and apply for these jobs anyway, you know, in case, because uh, there is, uh, there is what they call a servant crisis going on, and you always hear about this in old books and things, and of the time that it was really hard, it was very hard. You know that old cliche. It's so hard to get good help these days, and these rich people and who who are not able to get enough servants to staff their giant houses. And and I remember once I was on a. I shouldn't have gone on this. But I was dating a woman for not very long, for only a couple of weeks, then I got invited to her house for Thanksgiving, her family's house, and we were probably, like, it was probably late 20s. Go to this house, didn't know her that well, knew that she came from a pretty good background. Go to this house in New Jersey for Thanksgiving with her family, and it's, it's a mansion. It's insane what this house was like, and there's people all over, she's got a giant family, and and I should have known better. But anyway, you know, and sitting at the table, you know, the whole day, like the dad's playing golf for nine hours, you know, but the rest of the family's there cooking and stuff. And <clears throat> I think he was an architect. Um, 
we're sitting at the table, and sitting with this very, very nice older woman next to me, and there's some kind of like thread on the floor or something, or some kind of I don't know, it looks like some old line, like old wire, like built into the floor. And I, I notice it because my foot keeps clicking on it, and, and the, the elderly lady, lady said, you know, points that out to me, explains what that is. She goes, oh, in the old days, that was like for the servants that you put your, you'd press your foot on that, and it would, and it would buzz a bell. So, so the servant would come, you know, in and you know, give you whatever you wanted, more, more wine, I suppose, or you know, clean, clean up the mess you made, or I don't know, um, more potatoes, pass the potatoes. Who knows? Um, and then, the, but then she says, you know, she says, of course, that, that was in the days when you, when you had servants. And it was like, and then all of a sudden I felt like I was in some ser- silly old movie or something where like, the days when you had servants, like, no, no, the days when you had servants, the days when I would have been a servant. But anyway, you know, it's just a sweet lady, but it's just, it's just a different point of view, different view of life that people have growing up in different circumstances. And that's what the author of this book is kind of going through because she knows about servants. She's had servants, and I'm not saying she was super rich or hoity-toity or anything, but she was from that time, that period of life when if you had a decent house, a big house, uh, uh, even middle class, you probably had to have domestic services because because th- there were no appliances. You know, there was people, I mean, and this is work. What these people are doing is work laundry, uh, making food from scratch, you know, just taking flour and eggs and, and, and making, you know, nothing, nothing's out of boxes, nothing's, uh, you know, put, making toast with a oven and, you know, and having to start fires on different, you know, in 10 fires in different parts of the house and that, if you had any kind of, uh, major living space at all it required a lot of people to work there so it's not that it was the only the super super rich had servants it's just people it was just a, a part of life you know people like uh um the bennett's family in in pride and prejudice would have had servants uh of some kind you know or have cooks you know at least a few people around um compared to what we would think of today is just like a massive house with footmen and butlers and you know all that stuff that you have that requires a big house even a small house might have servants um so that's her perspective so she's reading this ad she really doesn't know how to do it she doesn't have any references so she gets the idea to put her own ad in i'm going to see if i can read i can find it Okay, yes, I think I'm going to be able to find it. Oh, here it is. Okay, so she puts an ad in the Situations Wanted column that reads, here it is, as housemaid, parlor maid, or house parlor maid, a refined and educated young woman obligated to earn her living and unable to find other employment once situation as above expects only such treatment as is given to servants, will wear caps and aprons, see there it com- comes in the caps and aprons again, but would not wish to share bed with another. Though we're li- thoroughly reliable and confident, references town and country, wages 14 pounds. Then address, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's funny, even when she goes to, to turn this in, the clerk, uh, who she's, she takes the ad to, the clerk at the, at the newspaper, it gives her a weird look, and then she goes, I'm going to have to ask my boss about this one. And then the boss looks it over and they go, I guess there's nothing wrong with it. We'll put it in. You know, so it's evidently highly irregular to have this kind of ad. Um, then she puts it in. The next day she gets 159 replies. What I, This is one of my favorite parts of the book when she goes through these replies because what she does not get is 159. 59 interview offers for maid jobs, mostly what she gets is uh, 
other kinds of offers because they can tell the people who read this can, can tell right away that she's got a pretty good education and and is is not of the normal class of servant so they try and hire her for other things uh, which she doesn't want because she's doing this for uh, you know for experience for the newspaper articles there's a lot of people who want her to hire her as a lady's companion i think people who read these kind of books from this era know what that is uh, a paid companion a uh, lady's companion, you know, just like somebody to hang out and be your friend if, you, if you're wealthy and you don't have uh, access to other people of your own class because everyone around you is a servant, um, that kind of thing, or, or your family members, or maybe uh, you're, you don't have your own family or, or your family, uh, um, or you're separate for other reasons. A lot of, and there are a lot of women who were from a good family but really didn't have their own resources and had to work would find work like that, just being paid to be some old lady's friend or something like that, which might be a pretty good job someday, for these days even for somebody, but who knows, it would probably be kind of a drag. Uh, just a curious thing that happened in, in those days, paid companions. She gets a few marriage proposals, of course. She just gets some people telling her, you know, you don't want to do this. You don't want to be a, you know, just like just disinterested, disinterested people saying, eh, you know, you don't really want to be a domestic servant, believe me, and that kind of thing. And she gets some job offers. So she gets some low ball offers, you know, people who just want to pay her like 12 pounds a month or, and she doesn't get really that many good offers. She gets one where she goes to this woman's house, interviews. Um, the woman's very nice to her and says, you know, I really can't help you, you know, after. Oh, this is another thing that's interesting, you know, the thing about how you have to be tall. And that's why she's afraid to interview. Um, when she does uh, go on, the few interviews that she does get on this, they're like, oh, you're so small, though. I don't know, you know. So they're, what they're looking for is, what you s sort of start to realize is the people who are looking for servants not and who are having difficulty finding them because they are in demand. First of all, they don't want to pay a premium wage. And I don't think, I think 14 pounds is considered, it's not excessive for what she's, for what she's doing. She's not asking really high rate. Um, people don't want to pay above market value for a good servant. They'd rather just keep having having bad servants, or they just they don't want, they don't want to hire a inexperienced person. And she's kind of and she's pretty honest about her lack of experience. But they don't want to pay a lot to hire away like the best person either. Um, so they want they want a really competent, hardworking. Uh, person and they don't want to pay a lot for it and um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought and but they have they have these concepts about who's able to do the work like they want a really big robust woman like healthy healthy tall uh, you know they don't want they the people keep saying oh you're too petite you're too diminutive for this kind of work I don't think you can handle it so this one person even sends her, you know, she goes, I can't, I can't hire you because I don't think you're physically up to the job, but here I'll write a, I'll write a letter uh, for, for you to my friend at an employment agency. So just go to this employment agency and, and uh, maybe they can help you there. And here's a shilling for a bus fare. And she doesn't want to take the money and the, the bus fare because she doesn't really need it. She's not doing it for that. And, but then she really can't. You know, the woman insists and she, now she leaves, she's got this letter and this, and this shilling and she's not going to go to the employment agency because she's really just trying to find a, a maid job and he knows, she knows that they're going to try and find, get her to do something else, like be a, a tutor or something like that. <clears throat> and then she's starting to feel guilty about uh, um, the whole de deceptiveness of the projects. So she gives the shilling to like a woman on the street, a homeless woman or something, and she opens the letter and reads in this this really kind letter, and it it's really uh, moves her mostly that this woman just who she applied for the job for just takes upon uh, upon herself to really try and help her, and and anyway, it's a a nice moment in the story where she's where she realizes that. Uh, 
where she has some issues with the play acting part of it. Anyway, so I'm not going to obviously uh, recap the whole book. She she gets a job. Uh, she finally does get a job at one of the places, and, and um, she gets the schedule she's supposed to work. And this part kind of reminded me of Barbara Ehrenreich's book from I think it was probably the late '80s, maybe a little, maybe the early '90s. Barbara Ehrenreich's Nickel and Dimed, where Barbara Ehrenreich then, then was working as an investigative journalist for Mother Jones or the, or the Nation or something like that, goes undercover. In the United States, working as a waitress, and, and the same kind of thing. She's from the upper classes, you know, educated person. She's really not prepared for the workload and, and the sort of the sort of draining, mentally, emotionally draining uh, world of, of working for tips and and you know, and she's trying to go home at, at night and write, and she just. Uh, it's just so exhausted that she can't write or form her thoughts and any, anything. Uh, it's a little bit of the same thing starts uh, goes on with Elizabeth Banks here. She goes her first job. She gets this amazing work schedule that literally is from 6.30 in the morning. No, what was it? Because it's very important actually because it's exactly seven and a half hours. 10.30 at night is her bedtime. 10.30 at night to, what is that, 6.30 to 10.30 be seven hours, so it's, uh, it's oh, it's 10.30, 10.30 to 6, I think it is, and she's, she, her workday starts at 6 a.m., she's supposed to be up at 6 a.m., she has a list of like three or four, you know, she has to go around the house, start the fires, um, she has to go, she has to find the uh, gentleman, the gentleman house, the the husband of the house's coat and brush it out and shake it out and hang it up. And she has like th like three hours of tasks, and then she gets breakfast, and then she has another three or four four hours of tasks and turning over. And you have to do X number of bedrooms a day, turn, turning them over, turning them out, whatever they call it. I'm not really sure what that is, but I think it's changing the linens and airing out the rooms and all that. Then you get lunch, and then you do all these other things, and then you go to bed at, at 10:30. So basically every you know, for whatever wage she's making, plus meals and board, she's working every minute of the day. There's no breaks. There's no. I mean, I'm sure they have take little breaks when they can and stuff, but there's there's no unscheduled time. And um, now Elizabeth Banks, and she's pretty frustrated with this, as you would imagine, especially when the first night. You know, it's 10.30, she's like, boy, I'm ready to get to bed, and she's go, about to go to bed, and the mystery, the head maid or whatever is like, ah, hey, you can't go to bed. Yeah, we got to wait down here. We got to wait till so-and-so gets back because he doesn't have a key, and, you know, we have to wait down here so, uh, to let him in when, and then she just, like, breaks down. <laughs> so anyway, she has, her ledger time is the seven and a half hours a night that she gets to sleep, everything else to sleep, and everything else belongs to her employer. Um... And, you know, she's honest about that. She, she doesn't really take any particular side. She's kind of even-handed. Uh, I'll go into that in a minute um, with her overall assessment of what it's like. This, isn't, this is definitely not a socialist or, or, or social, um, I can't remember what the name was. What they used to call these. It's, this is not like Ehrenreich's book, for example, which is like a discussion of class and, and race and all that kind of thing. She's just, uh, she's not trying to make any political point either way. She's just trying to write these experiences as kind of entertainment for, for newspaper readers. Um, she's not trying to, to do social improvements or anything like that, but in, in, in my view, this, 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 what I learned so far in this part of the book was the, the reason that these women, uh, mostly women, there's some men who tried to hire her too, but mostly these house, whoever's running these households, don't want to hire an educated person uh, for this job, is they want to hire, they have very definite opinions of this other class of people, the quote-unquote working class. And 
never occur to them that these people might have inner lives, they might need some time off or anything. They just, they, they truly do not see the problem of, look, look, I'm paying you to do a job and the job is uh, 15, 16 and a half hours a day. I don't understand what the problem is. And, and then you start to see, you know, like how this, the seamstress, the attitude of the seamstress at the beginning was like, I'm not going to be somebody's slave all the time, even if the work is a little better paid and, you know, there was uh, one of the interviews, I can't remember if this was the job she got or not, where she's, where the person interviewer says you can't, well, you have to get rid of that fringe, meaning, I, I don't know, some kind of hairstyle, fringe, whatever. Uh, you can't wear that if you're going to, you know, work in my house. you, you got to change your hair. And, and I think she doesn't take that job. So, and the people are, that are trying to talk her out of taking this job are like, oh, you're, you're so much better than this, you know. So there's a huge lot of uh, snobbery, um, unexamined snobbery, where people just assume that these other people, that, they're, that their lives are so intimately involved with to work for them don't have the same needs or desires or anything and, and you just look, look I'm paying you to work just work and then don't and so of course they have a low opinion of servants they think they're all idiots they think they're all incompetent they think they're all lazy uh, and the uh, servants have attitude towards the owners and the masters they're just trying to get everything they can out of you so you know just look out for yourself and Then about halfway through the book, she, fin she, she moves on some different type of jobs, but she, she does kind of an assessment, Banks does, of uh, what she thought was wrong with the industry. And like I said before, she doesn't have, she doesn't really take sides. It's pretty balanced. She's, on one hand, she's saying, you know, the, the mistresses, the employers of people need to, need to be a little more understanding of of the conditions they set and then they wouldn't have such a servant problem. The reason they have a servant problem is because their their expectations are are skewed. And they're demanding of people things they would never um, submit to themselves. On the other hand, you know, she feels like, uh, Banks feels like the, the servants need to be better trained. There's really no sort of system at least the way she describes it, there's there's no system in, in place in society to really get this work organized and and get these jobs done well and 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 sort of manage this industry. She talks about that there needs to be more schools, even maybe like publicly funded ones, that teach people the skills they need for these jobs, so they can be better at them and then so they can be done more efficiently. And it makes sense to me because you think of different places you've worked. Um, you know, a, a well-run company has good training for the employees, has good uh, opportunities for advancement or, or, or good uh, ways to, to handle feedback. And you can imagine people just running their own household. They're not going to do all that. You know, I've, there's some people I was going to say I've met, but I haven't actually met them. There are some, I belong to a couple of uh, Facebook groups here for expats I hate that term I don't consider I don't use that term for myself but a lot of people love it it's very romanticized uh, term you know okay take it easy Scott and Zelda you're not expats you're just p people traveling or living outside the country or whatever anyway these expat um, expatriate Facebook groups that I belong to in Albania you see um, some some of the same issues come up. For example, there was a post recently from a, a German woman who was looking for uh, a recommendation for a maid here, and she was like, I, I really need a maid, uh, not too expensive, um, and willing to work, and, and some of the exchanges go back, she, and she's like, she says, and I can't believe somebody would think this way, but uh, people do, and people get very entitled. She says, I'm finding that Albanians do not know how to clean. Imagine you're looking for a, a, a domestic, a maid, I don't know, part-time, whatever, she's probably looking just for a slave, um, you know, so she can stand there with her fingers crossed and, you know, you know her arms.
arms crossed and, and you missed the spot, you missed the spot. I, I don't know, just so fits me. Imagine saying something like that in an ad, like, look, I want a maid in this stupid country. I'm trying to find a maid in this stupid country to work for uh, what, what, I, what I decide as a foreigner I should have to pay. And, and by the way, I know none of you are any good at this. And so, of course, she got sort of slammed in the comments, which is good. I, I refrained myself uh, from saying, you know, like, you know, imagine if somebody said that to her. Imagine if somebody said, you know, well, in my experience, uh, Germans make obnoxious uh, uh, employers. I would never work for a German because they're obnoxious. You know, but she's fine saying, like, just finally saying Albanians, uh, an entire nation of people, don't know how to clean. So uh, that kind of thing really upsets me. And I, I felt there's a lot of, I wanted to stay out of it because I don't want to get involved in those groups very much. You know, I, I belong to them so I can hear about different opportunities that come up in the country and learn about ways to stay here permanently if I wanted to, but I'll probably be moving on. But I see this, you know, the same thing, it's that same attitude in these, um, in these uh, people who are hiring servants in London. So on one hand, they have a servant problem. People, people don't want to work anymore. You know, as, as we know, as we hear all the time, people just don't want to work anymore. Um, and then their, their demands that they don't want the people to be human beings in the same sense that they are. They, want, they think that a wage hires an entire person not just their labor so uh, but this is this is my uh, bias going on to it. Elizabeth Banks is more like you know um, you know she sees both sides where the you know people the the, the labor pool for domestics isn't isn't that great um, and that there should be schools to teach people these jobs more properly and, and teach people to manage these houses more efficiently so the work wouldn't be so so hard to manage and and um, like I was saying before it's uh, the the wealthy people do this you know they, they don't they're hoping that they can hire somebody so they don't have to think about it right you see this all the time like and I've I've found this so much in, in my life when you hire somebody to do a job, you, you now you've hired yourself to, to, to manage them. You know, it's really, there's a lot of things it's just easier to do yourself rather than to have to uh, count on someone else to do it and then have to police their work, especially if it's something like this that you just can't get service anymore. I bet if you paid three times the, the wage, you could get like the best servant. But they, that doesn't seem reasonable to people. And... Uh, um, they could also do their own housework, which in, you know, to be fair, in these days, you cannot run some of these houses yourself. You need extra people, even if you're doing some of the work, even if you're Hannibal Lecter and, and cooking the meat for your own party, you still need uh, to hire servers and all that. I don't know why that popped in my head. That's from the TV series, the Hannibal Lecter TV series they did where, with Mads Mikkelsen, and he has these parties where he, where he, invites all the other characters from the show over and feeds them human meat uh, without them knowing it and he he does he does the parts he likes he prepares the dishes because he's a cook and but, but he has all the staff around to do serving and stuff that he the catering staff that he hires to do that so um <laughs> that was really non sacra i don't know have no idea anyway so I thought it was worth reading. It's not, it reminded me a bit of, and it's not in this class, unfortunately. I was looking, I was expecting, uh, I probably had too high of expectations coming in because I thought it was such a cool idea for a book. Um, there's a book, Down and Out in Paris and London by George Orwell, which is a book told in two parts. The first part is him in working in a Paris restaurant. I can't remember if he was a waiter or he worked in the kitchen, probably worked in the kitchens. And it's and that's a great, compelling story of the same kind of thing of, you know, behind the scenes and what it's like to work in those places and what the health code violations are, all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, 
very well written because that's all well. So this is a book. I don't know if she wrote other books. I really maybe should have researched her a little bit more. It's kind of a curiosity. It is interesting if you're interested. If you read a lot of uh, Victorian fiction, Victorian age fiction, like I think a lot of us do on BookTube, it's really, really one of the greatest times in all of uh, literature, probably the greatest would be, wouldn't you say, the, the late 19th century? Just think of, you know, just Dickens alone and, or the Russians or the French novelists. Um, you could just read Victorian fiction for your whole life and and you never run out of the good stuff, I don't think. Anyway, I've been uh, talking a lot about um, pulp fiction and that kind of thing on my channel, but I do like to do both kinds, so hopefully I'll get to more more Victorian fiction in days to come. Overall, summing up the book, it was worth reading. It's more of a curiosity than an essential read, but she has a she has an engaging style. Elizabeth Banks does. Uh, she's pretty de self deprecating about the problems she has uh, working and you know being quite honest about not being really qualified. But I, I thought kind of the sort of the reading between the lines and my own sort of um, opinions of 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 what was going on there, which which. Uh, informed my reading more than what she was saying. So, yeah. Um, then she goes, the second half of the book, she does similar things like working in laundries, working as a laundress. Uh, you know, another tough kind of work. And, you know, it's... Uh, these, were, these were tough. These were tough lives for most people. You know, this is a long, physically demanding days. They didn't have phones, so they had nothing else to do except work, like, to the bone, I guess. But, you know, that's most people's lives. It's, uh, so we're, those of us who have time to read books and are able to retire at some point or have YouTube channels or some leisure reading and pursue some of our own interests, we're very, very lucky. At least I am. So that's my review of the book, and we'll talk again soon. If I can get